Today we're going to cover uses for AI, but we're also going to deal with author voice and, and talk about what author voice is and why a robot can't, um, can't uh, replicate that most important part of your writing, which is what agents are looking for. Um, okay, so let's dive in. Um, best uses for AI involves... Um, one of the first things that I noticed is that AI is particularly good for identifying where public discussion ends. So, um, chat GD GDP um, runs on a data set that uh, is actually two years old. So, they wanted to keep um, uh, all the existing content nice and clean. Um, this is obviously an educational and experimental AI. Um, up until it was produced, people weren't sure if this was possible. And so um, anytime you have a, a young company that's trying to develop new technology, they tend to be very risk adverse. Um, and uh, when you're training an AI, you also have to be careful to narrow down what content goes into that AI from the beginning. So for example, um, it was learned early on as scientists were developing AIs that if you, whatever information you gave the AI at the beginning um, would heavily bias the AI forever. So you could actually depress, uh, you, you could give an AI depression um, if you front loaded it with negative content um, and then gave it an equal amount of positive content later, it would fixate on the negative content. Um, and, and it would take thousands or tens of thousands of iterations to try to nudge the AI's opinions after that. Um, so right now what you're seeing in ChatGDP is a data set that is two years old, it is hand-picked. Um, this AI does not have access to the internet as a whole and it does not have access to current events. In fact, when I did initial um, discovery for this AI, trying to figure out how it worked and, and what it operated on. Um, I gave it a vol volatile topic and I asked it to pretend to write a magazine article about um, cheating in romance and uh, was looking, I, I, sp I specifically prompted it to look for a researcher's perspective and connect that to publishing. And it spat back some really interesting content. Um, it was more empathetic in its research than I expected it to be, um, just based on the, the risk adverse nature of a lot of these companies as they're developing the research. I expected it to be um, uh, pretty pretty narrow in its perspective, and it did a good job of, um, of addressing some of the stigmas and stuff, um, as, as well as the volatility and hurt feelings. It did a really good job with all the emotional content, and it uh, chat GDP presents very coherent, structured sentences, um, and, and in that regard, it is by far the most advanced technology that we have out here. Um, where the technology fell short, I noticed right away that when I asked it to cite sources for the research it was presenting me, um, that it seemed to only have access to three to five articles on that topic. Um, in its entire data set. And, and as I stress tested the AI and pushed it heavily to generate additional research, it just didn't have any to draw on. Um, so that is something to be aware of as you are generating content. And as I talk about some of the uses, the best uses for AI, a lot of the best uses are going to be um, not necessarily creative, but really helpful on the business side of putting together an author career. There are creative uses for this as well, and I will show you what they are. Um, but I believe that the, where writers right now are going to experience the greatest efficiency jumps are gonna be in your nonfiction content that you have to produce on the side, including um, emails, sales and website copy, um, formal letters, including query letters. This can write query letters for you. Um, I have used chat GDP to produce over 50 pages of legal documentation. Um, and it was le specifically legal documentation that I had been procrastinating putting together for like a year and a half. 
Um, and I know that I am still liable for whatever comes out in the legal documentation that um, I can't rely on that to be complete right off the get go. But it saved me probably 100 hours drafting uh, some very technical documentation. It did a very good job um, grabbing an initial base structure and a template for me to work with. So anytime you have nonfiction content where um, where the structure is clear and the material is well known, ChatGDP is going to do an amazing job of generating that quickly. That is why, specifically why legal documentation is so easy to produce and has a pretty high quality in this setup right now. Um, it's because that content is known, the structures are well known, the clauses have... Um, the clauses you use in legal documentation are, are fixed within pretty narrow windows and there's some variation but all the wording that that is out there has very fixed meanings that's extrapolated on in a lot of areas so tons of data for the ai to pull from um this and and a good example of legal documentation that everybody has to produce when you are putting together your author website you need a privacy notice um, and terms of use that goes on your website. It's a very boring page. Nobody wants to produce that. It does need to be um, clean and up to date though. And so when I went to ChatGDP, one of the first things I asked it to generate was terms of use and privacy notice for the website. Um, and it did a great job of hashing that together for me in about five minutes. So um, some of the other limitations that you should be aware of as we go through these examples, um, and again, if you have access to uh, watch my video screen, um, uh, if you check in on our Facebook feed, I'm going to have some videos that I can show you that I've pre-recorded of ChatGDP working in different um, environments and on, on different prompts. So if you go to Facebook and you search for Mithulu, that's M-Y-T-H-U-L-U, -U, then you can follow along on the visual part of this discussion. Um, so one of the things that ChatGDP is limited on right now, uh, the service is frequently down. Um, so they are working on expanding their capacity. I don't know exactly how fast they're working on expanding that capacity. Um, but I do find that this service is down about 80% of the time. It's uh, typically, especially down in the mornings, um, and I'm not sure why that is, but um, uh, sometimes I have to go back to the AI several times at different times of day to get in. Um, one of the next limitations that it has is it has a, a limited word count that it will pump out for you. I don't know exactly what that word count is. I think it's somewhere between 500 and 1,000 words. Um, so anytime you're drafting a larger document, like a privacy terms of use, it will actually, it will spit out most of the documentation and then it will end with a comma or an incomplete sentence, kind of letting you know that there is more to be had and you can just prompt the AI to continue and it will continue its train of thought. So the fact that the AI can continue a train of thought across prompts is one of the things that sets GDP apart from any chatbot to date. Um, and it can also learn. So if you are generating a short story and you want to build a character over time, you can give it a series of prompts and you can ask it to adjust its idea of a character or the tone of a character and it will take what it has learned, what you have fed it, up until that point to um, to flesh out the content, and it will it will also grab um, it will grab content that it has created and work that in as part of a detailed story. If you do long prompts across multiple iterations, so um, let's go through some of these examples. Um, and again, if you have questions, go ahead and raise your hand in the Discord channel. You can hit that little hand button to request to speak, and I can activate your microphone so we can have a in-person discussion. Um, so this first example here shows um, w one of the uses that I appreciate with chat GDP is that you can educate yourself on a complex, complex topic. And ChatGDP is particularly useful for seeing where public discussion on a topic 
currently ends. So you can see the cutting edge and the frontier of where people are petering out in a discussion. So in this example, I asked ChatGDP to talk with me about diversity in the publishing industry. Um, and it did an amazing job, actually. This is a topic where there is a lot of public discussion already, and so it, it gathered from hundreds of blog articles and public discussions to um, put together a pretty scathing list of what's wrong in the publishing industry when it comes to diversity. So after it spat out this initial, um, this initial prompt, I asked it to iterate a little bit. Um, so we can ask it how much these changes would improve readership or profitability for publishers. Anytime you ask for numbers on something like that, ChatGDP is, is going to hem and haw and not want to give you specific numbers. That is the risk adverse nature of the AI. Um, the technology is certainly capable of predicting numbers, it just doesn't have confidence on the numbers in its data set, and so it has been trained to not give specific numbers. Um, but it is estimating ways in which it could be profitable, and if you are writing an article on a topic like this, you can grab those initial brainstormings and go track down numbers yourself. So that is one of the places in which the AI content generation meets the human, um, the human advantages. Only a human can go through and really vet that data carefully um, and bring it up to a human's standard of reliability. But the AI does an amazing job of generating the initial outline. Um, and we're not gonna show this whole video in real time, but you can kind of see some of the questions that I, I bring to the discussion. I ask it, um, to estimate people that, you know, what's, what are the reading rates for people who, um, you know, have stressful lives and not necessarily as much time for reading? What are some of the challenges for publishers and employers that are preventing diversity? Um, and it spat out, um, uh, sometimes when the numbers are very known and when it's a symbol number, it will actually generate statistics for you. So that's something that's shown here. But, um, yeah, so this, this generated 10,000 words easily for me in about 15 minutes. Um, and I was able to go through and just glean what I was interested in. There are, um, as you're working through something like this, you start to see repetition in the responses that you get. And that is how you start to see where public conversation ends. So you, you can ask the AI stressful questions, challenging questions, and where the AI starts to fall flat on its answers, that is your opportunity as a writer, as an author, to add a human element and add value to the discussion beyond what an AI can do. Um, let's see. Yes, and this shows where I asked it a long question it gave me a comma at the end of its response, and I told it to continue. Um, let's see, what else do we have here? Um, so overall, I mean, it just this discussion between me and the AI went on until I ran out of questions to ask it, and it ran out of content to give me. Um, this is a great way to... So there are multiple uses for something like this. You can use it for... I get, like I said, educating yourself on a complex topic. Um, you can use it to do initial research. If you are, um, if Googling a topic is hard and you are having trouble finding um, good summaries of the information that's out there, the AI will do a good job um, of, you know, in this example, uh, giving me 20 different conventions that I could go to to learn more about diversity and another 20 that I could go to if I wanted to connect with people um, across diverse demographics. Um, so very useful both in reducing research, in outlining nonfiction content, and, um, and seeing where you can add value to the discussion, to, to the public discussion. So those are some of my favorite uses for AI right now. Uh, let me show you one of the cautions that you want to watch out for.
So with that last discussion that we just had about diversity in publishing, I asked the AI to then generate a series of tweets about all this content. So I said, write five tweets that demonstrate um, action toward these, what did I say? Action toward the goals mentioned above. Um, and the tweets that it generated were um, almost offensively generic. Um, and and when I when I saw these results come out, I, I kind of laughed uncomfortably because they they were not good tweets. Um, the first example, the AI said, "Excited to announce that our team is now 50% people of color, with a focus on bringing more diverse perspectives to our editorial process." Uh, and it has a hashtag. Um, some of these are better, where we're proud to announce that 50% of our book acquisitions are from authors from marginalized communities. Representation matters. Um, so there, there's a mix, and the AI can't necessarily tell, although it's risk adverse, um, there is that empathy side where the AI is not a sensitivity reader for you, um, and it can sometimes generate content that is not sensitive. Um, so after getting that initial, um, initial burst of content back, I clarified with the AI, like, yes, I want stuff that's goal-oriented and action-oriented, but kind of letting the AI know, don't assume that I've actually done anything yet, but indicate that I want to. Um, and that produced much, much better results. Um, the first tweet that it spat back said, calling all diverse writers, we're committed to increasing representation in our catalog and want to hear from you. Submit your work to us. In that situation, I'd probably replace the word diverse right in that first sentence with something more relatable um, and more humanizing. Um, you can, and, and this is where editing is particularly helpful. So sometimes I notice that when I'm writing social media content, I will agonize over different iterations for longer than I should. Um, and the AI can help you iterate quickly um, on a variety of topics. So in 30 seconds, it gives me five different topics that I can work through. And then you can adjust the tone. So when, when the AI spits something back that is not humanizing, you can kind of poke it a little bit and let it know what it did wrong. Um, so in this one, again, it just sounded very sterile, um, very corporate. And so I told the AI, like, please adjust those tweets, make them sound curious and excited about the rich content each crew can create instead of just focusing on like what it does for us. Um, and that's where it started to spit out content that, um, that was probably 90% close to being public ready. So any of the content the AI ever spits out is stuff that you're going to want to glean through, edit carefully, um, and look at it with a, a cautious eye, particularly when you are talking about volatile topics. Um, still run things through sensitivity to readers when you are working on sensitive content. But... Um, but that's another example for, for uses here. So after you use the AI to educate yourself on a complex topic or develop some nonfiction content, um, developing creative content too, any, any kind of content you create, you can then spit back into the AI and say, generate some tweets for me about this content. And it does a pretty good job of giving you some initial drafts. So another place where... Um, I have been really blown away by how much the AI increases my efficiency. This is probably my biggest efficiency gain. There's a, a limited amount of legal documentation that you need to produce and only so many tweets that you can put together a day. Um, but one of the really important marketing uh, content production cycles that I procrastinate to death is putting together emails. I know that email series can be very valuable to people. Um, we personally are very careful. Um, we, when we send people emails or newsletters, I hate sp getting spam in my inbox. And so I try to always, always craft emails that provide value to people on the other side. I have no interest in just spamming people so that I can keep my email stats up. I want to actually give you useful content and value every time 
um, I ask for your attention. So in this example that I'm about to show you, I put together an outline for a 21 day writing warm up series. Um, all I had when I went to the AI was an idea for which topics I wanted to hit on each day and what word count I wanted people to have. So the overall idea is that um, if you stop writing for a while, it takes 21 days to warm your creative brain back up and reach the same writing speeds and writing capacity per day that you have at your peak. So this, this warm-up series helps you make a daily commitment to increase your writing just a little bit a day, starting at about 100 words. Um, and uh, I wanted to produce a, an interesting email series that gives a different prompt each day um, on something that genuinely makes a difference with uh, creative sustainability, being, being able to maintain a creative commitment from day to day. So this is that example. And I start out by just asking the AI to produce a welcome email. And that welcome email was actually really good. Um, here you see my spreadsheet and I grab the topic for the next day. I go back to the AI and I paste that in. All right, I take a look at it. So the day one email, um, I asked it to write on the topic of prepping your writing space. Um, and I, uh, I gave some additional they give some additional comment on this. Um, sometimes when you give the AI more guidance, it, um, it starts copying what you say word for word. So if you want the AI to be more creative, you're actually better off sometimes um, reducing the complexity of your prompt. Um, so this was a fairly simple prompt. It said, topic is writing, is prepping your space, um, and their task for day one is just to clean their desk and schedule a time. Um, and again, it's spat back a very clean email that I would be perfectly happy to send out to my um, my email subscribers. It, it summarized, um, summarized the topic well, summarized the task well, grabbed some content from online to fill out some of the humanizing details and was surprisingly rich. So the next day topic was, the prompt was on tactile description. Um, let me see if I can skip forward a little. Yeah, tactile daydreams was the topic and the writing goal was 110 words. Fabulous job there. Um, Day three topic was concentration cycles. And this, this was where I discovered that if you give too much information to the AI, it stops trying to think on your on its own. Um, so crafting your prompts is a little bit of a balance between giving the AI enough information that it's not making um, uh, unhelpful assumptions and it's not leaning on public dialogue in useless ways. Um, uh, so you want to give it just enough information that, ha that it knows where you're trying to go with it, but not so much information that it stops trying to think and just copies what you say. So let's see, concentration cycles. Um, human contact was the day four topic. And I struggled again to find the balance between like, hey, this is what I want to talk about versus, um, you know, what I want you to fill in for me. Because the AI's job is to make this more efficient and do as much of the work as it can. Um, so, and uh, as you can see here, the AI is capable of adding content. Um, adding an extra paragraph if it forgot something. So overall, I would say as you're playing with ChatGDP and any other chat writing bot, I would start vague. And if it needs more detail, give it more detail. Um, but really take advantage of the fact that, a that the AI does a lot of thinking on its own. Um, let me check here. We've got... All right. OK, 
Okay, let's find another example here. We've got... Um, I am in, if any of you guys are experiencing technical detail, deep difficulties or you can't see my screen, um, I apologize for that. I'm not going to slow the live stream down right now, but um, I will go through and I will edit content later um, to make sure that all the examples and stuff do appear on screen in the uh, re-recording. So, um, okay. So that kind of covers initial drafts. Um, I do want to show you guys uh, on the creative side. So obviously we're all pro and aspiring writers um, and creativity is our most profitable activity, that, that creative rich um, fiction writing. So I kind of want to show you what the AI does when it comes to fiction writing. Um, this, in my opinion, is where the AI is weakest. It does not do well with subtext, um, and right now the creative content that it puts together is um, a little bit lifeless and hyper-generic. Um, I've heard rumor of another tool called PseudoWrite. I have not had opportunity to explore that much yet. PseudoWrite seems to do a better job of fiction content. Um, so I'll look into that, and uh, if I'm impressed with the tool, I'll put together another live stream on that one. But um, for now, we'll all just cover what ChatGDP accomplishes with fiction. So in this uh, example here, I asked ChatGDP to write a solar punk city description with very subtle subtext um, that implies, uh, what was it? implies disease has taken root in some of the plants in the city. Um, and you can kind of see here, let me pause that video. This says, the city of Solaria gleams in the bright sunlight, its towering skyscrapers made of sustainable materials that shimmer and change color with movement of the sun. The streets are lined with lush greenery and a network of rooftop gardens and vertical farms provide fresh produce for the city's inhabitants. Upon closer inspection, one can see brown spots on the leaves of the plants, a subtle hint that all is not well in this seemingly perfect utopia. So, this is actually a really good example of, um, I guess I'd call, I'd call GDP heavy-handed in the way it's describing things here. Um, it uses a lot of passive voice, uh, saying the streets are lined with this and things are this way. Um... And uh, describing the adjectives of things directly. So it, it says the city is using uh, sustainable materials. An author who is writing that would be more specific about what sustainable, sustainable materials the skyscraper is using. Um, and allow the reader to infer that the materials are sustainable um, so that's sort of the difference between what the AI does and what a person can do. The AI understands what should be there, but it doesn't dive that final layer into the details um, and let reader make final let readers make final assumptions. Um, and uh, and I think the the narrative perspective on this is um, also a little direct, almost like radio story like. You know, it says, upon closer inspection, you can see the brown spots on the leaves of the plants. Um, again, a, a human writer wouldn't do that. A human writer would put the reader's perspective inside a character and have the character discovering these things. So, based on those weaknesses, I asked the AI to... Uh, I refined my prompt and asked the AI to dig back into... Um, sorry, I'm bouncing around here in my my videos. Um, I asked the AI to produce the same content, but putting it in the perspective of a, a young girl um, sitting in a cafe. And, uh, and the result that I got was very simple, very childlike. It was the sort of thing I would expect from a fourth grader. Um, Still better than some of the stuff I see in my slush pile, but <laughs> um, 
but but heavy-handed and simplistic and um, lacking the rich observation that human writers can do. So I want to pause that there and use that to emphasize this shows one of the human strengths that you provide as a writer. Um, and, and this is where we dive a little bit into author voice. Um, author voice is specific. Author voice uses um, hyper, uh, hyper-focused hyper details versus general details. So anytime I see stories in my slush pile that use generic details, um, I feel like the author isn't pulling on their personal life experience to flesh out the details in the story. Um, and when I'm doing writing coaching and, and somebody presents me with generic details, even if they are more eloquently expressed than what the AI is doing here, I, I make them go back to the drawing board and I'll, I'll talk them through, what personal experience do you have with a hostage situation? What, what is the nearest experience you have to anything like this? And I force them to dig in their memories until they can find a near experience. And it might be something as simple as being grounded when you were eight. But those experiences are relevant. And whenever you can draw on your experiences and look back in your memories for the details that mattered to you in that moment, there is always a direct story parallel for those hyper-specific details, and you can use your memories as an anchor to fill out the details in a fictional scene. Um, this isn't you writing about yourself, this is you empathizing with deeper experiences that other people have had or could have based on what you know about life and humanity. So, using... AI to draft an initial story can still be valuable, but you need to know that that is one of the things you need to replace, and it it is the most important work that an author can do. Those super specific details um, and the and the rich experience that they give the reader are what agents are looking for in their slush piles. There, because there's two layers to your story. You have the clarity layer where you learn to string together coherent sentences, but then there's the voice layer, and the voice layer is where the rich experiences are at. Um, AIs are now capable of stringing together coherent sentences, so to stay competitive as a writer, you have to learn more about author voice and more about emphasizing your personal experiences and inserting thoughtful perspective and human perspective into moments to expand the discussion of moments like this because AIs can mimic but humans can innovate um so going back to this example I think I asked for like four or five different iterations um I didn't like the perspective that it gave me so I asked it to edit it and rewrite it in third person um it didn't give me any dialogue, which I thought was dumb. And so I, I asked for a meaningful interaction, like slow, face down, tell me less, and give me more of an experience and interaction. And that is where I, I actually got um, content that I was happy with and content that was creatively useful to me. Um, the, the robot barista that I asked for was pretty cute. Um, and there is a moment here at the end of this interaction where, uh, so in this interaction, in the, in the story, for those of you who can't see my screen, the girl asks the robot, like, oh, hey, I see that the plants are sick, what's going on? And the robot provides an informational response, which is very appropriate. Um, but when the girl expresses disappointment and she's sad by what the, the robot has expressed, the robot adds an emotional layer to that discussion that is hopeful. Um, and, uh, and I thought that that particular story beat was useful. So sometimes what you're looking for here as you're putting to together creative content isn't necessarily the structure. You are using the AI to stimulate your brain on, on what iterations are out there. The AI right now can't generate um, 
whole scenes or whole paragraphs for you in a way that's going to be useful, but it can help you um, explore a concept in the most generic of ways um, and start layering in some of that rich detail until it's until it sparks something for you and it spits back a beat a story beat that is useful that you can then anchor to and use to flesh out your story so that is that's how you can use ChatGDP to start drafting creative content it's very limited right now um, that is the full extent of its power creatively um, and I hope it's it's useful to you to understand that so if you're asking it to draw a blank slate for you you're providing very limited content to begin with, it's going to provide very limited content back. Now, if you have a story where you already have some content written, um, but there's a chapter that you're stuck on, for, for example, um, you can use the AI to start filling in some of the gaps. So in this example, in this video, um, I pulled a chapter that I cut out of a project. So this is a chapter I don't intend to use um, because it was broken and I was having trouble um, flushing it out more, um, I ask it to Let's see. Um, so I, I have the content already written, um, and I started by going to the AI and asking the AI to re-describe the scene that I had already written. I was curious what the AI would do, um, and the most interesting part that it gave me was um, some body language for the character that I thought was interesting, and, and that was a layer I hadn't thought to put in my description yet. Um, so after doing some of this blank slate, asking it to produce, to reproduce something that I'd already written, um, I actually grabbed some of the content um, and, um, let's see, where did I grab the actual paragraph? Here we go. So I, I grab a section of the content and then I spring it over here and I ask it to layer in visual details because when I mark down a draft, I usually just have the dialogue beats going back and forth and trying to solidify the human interactions. And then I go in later and I layer in some of the visual details and the tactile experience. Um, and this was kind of interesting. Um, again, the AI tends to put in really heavy handed details rather than subtle with subtext with the specifics that a, a human would think to put in based on their life experiences. Um, so the visual details that it spat back for me were, um, let's see, there we go. I asked for nostalgic and ominous details. And of the full paragraph it spat back to me, I think there were like two or three details that I could use, which isn't a lot based on how much content the AI produced, but it's three, two or three more details than we had before. And, um, and more importantly, this was a, a scene that I was completely stuck on, where I had run out of creative um, enthusiasm for the piece. And by, the, by using the AI to kind of explore a little bit more what that scene looks like, it brought me back into a creative mindset where I started to empathize with the characters and get excited again about what they were going through, what they might be feeling, and what, what they might look like in that moment. Um, so that is one of the uses for AI if you already have some content written. Um, let's see. Oh, I just... Close my Discord window. Come back, Discord. Um, the AI is also really good at editing mood. So if you have a chapter or a scene or a section and you're getting feedback from your beta readers or you just notice, like, oh, this is kind of depressing. This is a little, little too heavy-handed. Um, or maybe you want to transition between... Um, starting out in one mood and moving it to a 
you know, if you want to start hopeful and end ominous, or the other way around, you can put in the details, uh, uh, put in the chunk of text, tell the AI to change the mood of that section, and it will go through and replace details that were heavy with hopeful, if that's what you asked it to do. They're going to be generic, but it can help you identify some of the places where you can clean up the manuscript quickly. Um, I find that this speeds up my editing process maybe 50-60%. Um, it's not a huge boost, but it is a boost, and more importantly, it maintains your inertia. It keeps you from getting stuck while you're you're going through, and every once in a while it spits back, spits back something that you would consider on your own. Um, as you are working with the AI, if you're using it heavily, you will find this error where it will say, too many requests in at one hour, please try again later. This is uh, one of the other limitations of ChatGDP right now. So in addition to the system regularly being down, um, it's not going to let you sit on there actively forever once you do get in. Um, I'm really hoping that they... Uh, expand their capacity and offer a reasonable paid tier soon um, so that access to this AI is continual. Um, unfortunately, if their AI is down and you want to access some of the chat dialogues you had with the AI prior, it does keep a whole history, which is amazing, of any prompt that you've given it before. Um, but you can only access those if the AI is online for you, if it lets you in. If the AI is busy, um, you cannot access your history at that time. So hopefully that will change in the next few months. But um, if you see that error message, that's why and that's what's going on. Um, I'm going to pause here for a second. Does anybody have any questions? Um, I don't see any hands coming up yet. Um, let's see... Let's see if there's questions in the open chat. Apologies. Audio. Voice. Hearing it now. Okay. All right. Um, let's look at. Okay, so we've covered drafting, we've covered editing. Um, this final example, um, it seems like most people can't see my video right now, so I'll probably skip through this video quickly and edit it in later. Um, but the video example here shows, um, final author choices, where I take what I've gathered from the AI, um, specifically in that last example where I had some pre-existing content and I asked it to flesh out some of the tactile and emotional details. Um, this video example shows what I, um, what I kept of, uh, of what the AI gave me. I think there were only, only a few pieces I used. Um, it did help me to cut out content quickly. So I'd barfed down a bunch of initial content before, and easily a third of it was useless right off the bat. Um, I just didn't have anything richer to put in, and as soon as I had richer detail, it was very easy for me to go in and let go of uh, senseless comment, uh, senseless con content that wasn't emotionally vibrant. Um, so here, um, it just describes, this is an anthropomorphic story, so animals acting like people, and I'm describing an otter sitting on top of some battlements wrapped in a blanket. Um, and writing in a journal. And the part that I took from the AI uh, was a, some description of his face. Um, and I tried some iterations of it, trying to, um, trying to paraphrase what the AI had given me and put it in my own words. In the end, I was most satisfied with the simple description the AI had given. Um, the AI initially said, um, I think that stubbornness and uh, determination were etched on his face, but today his, his eyes were tinged with sadness. 
Um, and the final phrasing that I stuck with was a lifetime of laughter and determination. Um, so I, I replaced stubbornness with laughter. A lifetime of laughter and determination was etched on his face, but tonight his eyes were tinged with unhappiness. So the, the phrasing the AI gave me, gave me was very useful. The density of that sentence was fantastic. It was tight. It was clean. And um, after struggling with it for 10 minutes, there was very little I could do to improve on the quality of the structure of the sentence the AI had given me. Um, and the most valuable thing I was able to do was just swap out um, the generic details it had given me for the precise details that matched the character I had. Um, let's see. And after that, I got into, you know, after inputting that one sentence, that one detail, I got into a creative flow um, and was able to uh, write a paragraph um, and uh, go through and edit some of the other pre-existing paragraphs that were there um, that, again, I'd, I'd just gotten depressed and I'd run out of creative steam for this chapter. Um, but the AI got me back in the flow with it. So, um, so from a writer's perspective, I find the AI, the AI particularly useful. Overall, I would recommend that you use the AI for editing whatever you are weakest at right now. If you look at, uh, if you, so if you are struggling with sentence clarity and people are letting you know that you're, you're, writing is hard to read. The AI is going to be fantastic at helping you cut passive voice from your sentences. Um, it can help you cut down on some of the word glut and improve readability. So you can go paste a section into the, the AI and say, uh, reduce the reading grade level for this sentence and it will replace whatever is not working about that content with um, denser sentences, that is going to be a fabulous use for this. So let's see. Um, so one of the things you should know is that if you generate content with AI, there is already a, um, a bot that you that can filter um, content to see if it was AI written. This is not, it doesn't have access to JetGDP's um, production protocol, so it can't actually tell, but it guesses based on how generic or detailed the content is. Um, and so I took the, the section that I had rewritten and edited using the AI, and I pasted it in here to see if it could catch the part that was AI written. It did not catch the part that was AI written, um, which I had uh, personalized. Um, it skipped right past that, but what it did do was it highlighted something that I had already written that was so generic it came across as AI written. And uh, that I thought was was interesting. Um, so my my body language is generic. I just say he paused. My um, visualization is very generic, saying a sad smile danced across his face. Could I do better? Maybe. Is it worth editing this to death? Maybe not. Um, probably not in this case. But um, if you are having a problem uh, connecting with readers and um, and people are not getting excited about what you're putting in front of them, it might be because you have a little too high a density or, or the percentage of generic details in or generic action in your work is still too high. So you can actually go use this anti-AI uh, algorithm to identify the generic pieces in your work. So it's still using computer-assisted uh, editing identification, um, which I find ironic uh, based on the fact that this is supposed to be like anti-computer. Um, but what it really is, what it really boils down to is this is anti-generic. It's an anti-generic filter. And any of these AIs, any of these computer systems that you are using, just keep in mind it's a filter. The chat GDP is a filter that forces all of your concepts and queries through the perspective of pre-existing public conversation. Chat GDP is a filter that 
assesses the weakness in public conversation um, and lets you know in which cases you might be relying on that subconsciously in your own work. Um, let's see. Um, so other weaknesses that the chat GDP has, I'm going to uh, spit through most of these. I'm through most of my outline here. Um, so system status, generic details, um, it does mixed tense. It doesn't, it doesn't um, spit back a consistent tense very well. So if you ask the AI to convert the tense of a piece, um, it's going to do a terrible job of that. That's pri primarily because um, if you're using a third, what is it, past tense, if you're using past tense in your work, which is one of the most common tenses, um, there's usually back and forth where anything that's in dialogue is present tense, but anything that's outside dialogue is past tense, and the AI just can't process that right now. Um, uh, and then it has that narrow risk-adverse perspective. Um, keep in mind also, everything in the chat GDP AI is outdated. It's two years old, so if you, are, if you have questions about current events, current conversation, um, the AI cannot help you there. Um, it can only help you with uh, historical examples of that topic. Um, where do I think AI is going? I think that the AI is... Um, the AI, and maybe there are tools are out there already that do this, but the AI, I think, will become most useful on a creative level when you can feed it a huge body of your own work. So if you've written multiple books and you can go and feed that into an AI and the AI can privately train on your language choices and learn your language style and the density of particular writing choices that you use, that is when it's going to be most useful creatively because it matches your voice and it can assist in some of the repetition um, and plot layout and stuff that you need to do. Um, so... I think you're going to see a huge increase in creative content after that technology improves and, and the private training of AIs is available. I don't think you're going to see um, a whole lot of genuinely viable uh, creative content that is exclusively AI written until that point, but after that um, you're going to see a huge dump, jump and you're going to see authors putting out 100 books a year that are genuinely written in their voice. Um, it will still be subject to the, the problems with generic details, but, um, but I think it's reasonable over time to expect that, um, truly productive authors who are putting in the same number of hours after AI training that they did before can, will probably be able to triple or quadruple their output each year. Um, so... That's, that's something I'm, I'm looking forward to, and I'm, I'm curious to see where the technology goes. Um, I think they'll also be really useful for, um, once it can mimic our voice, like some people are probably going to still be very reticent to use that for anything public-facing, even if they go through and, and do cleanup. I know that there's just a lot of controversy around AI, and there's some stigma with using it at the moment. Um, kind of similar stigmas, actually, that came about when um, digital photography came around and people were were frustrated with digital collection versus film collection. And there was, um, there was a lot of conversation about how digital photographers weren't real photographers or weren't serious photographers. And it's, it's, you know, it's taken a decade or two for the world to warm up to digital collection. Um, and I, I think it will take a, a similar period of time for the world to warm up to AI-assisted creativity. Um, I do think the world will get there. I think um, audiences will get excited as the content it meets their creative standards. Um, so the point at which the, the content is, is giving them the experience they want is the point at which I think people will embrace AI. Um, until then... You'll still be able to use uh, AI to rapid produce things like Patreon rewards. So if you want to produce bonus chapters quickly that don't cost you a whole lot of extra time, um, once you can train an AI on your voice and you can feed it an entire series of canon material, you can then go to the AI and ask it, oh, create a cute 
uh, a cute scene between these two characters that where this happens, and you can just feed back to your Patreon, uh, your Patreon crew, you know, 95% of what the AI gave you with uh, a little tweak here and there. And because it's not official publication content, it's um, it's exclusive sideline fan service content. The risk levels are different. And I think a lot of authors will be very comfortable spitting out content like that. And I think fans are still going to love it. Um, so any, anything like that is going to be uh, really promising. And I think the technology is going to explode um, over the next two years. I, I do think that you're going to see private AI training become available and get really good in the next two years. So that's something to keep an eye on. And as soon as that is available, I would encourage you guys to jump in on that technology and try to leverage it for your creative processes, because that that is a huge competitive advantage. So overall, I would recommend that you lean on AI when your anxiety is high around a project, um, when you're outside your most profitable activity or your comfort zone, um, or pre-publication when your sentence clarity is, uh, or variety is poor. So using when your anxiety is, hu is high, I think is an amazing use for it because, you know, we value humanity, but being human means having weaknesses. That's, that's the cost of our strengths. And AI is meant to help counter the things that weigh us down or freak us out. Um, like producing anything sales related, like that's, that's not what excites us. That's not what we're good at. We get very anxious in situations like that. And that is the perfect place for a computer to step in and say, let me help you with that. Um, cause the, the computer is going to be really good at that. So, um, if you are feeling yourself getting anxious as you're writing, turn to the AI and get some help. Don't spin your wheels beating up on yourself. Um, that is literally what computers are for. They're here to help us. Anytime you're outside your most, most profitable activity or your comfort zone, you know, keep in mind there's a lot of different types of writing and it's okay to not be good at all of them. Sales writing and legal writing are hard for most people. And if you don't have training in those areas, um, you can you can waste a lot of time uh, struggling with and wrestling with that those those types of writing because they're they're entirely different types of communication they have different goals um and and different density requirements so you, your readers want something different when they are reviewing legal documentation and they want something different when they are reading sales copy than when they are actually sitting down and reading your book so um so that's a good time to lean on ai and uh and to counterbalance the weaknesses in AI, remember, these are your human strengths. Specific details versus general details. Um, you as a human can take risks that the AI cannot and will not take. The AI is usually unwilling to state an opinion, but you as a human being can do that, and that is one of the hallmarks of human written content. Um, perspective is one of your strengths. So pay attention to unlikely things and slow down as you are producing. Step back from some of the plot and the, the action-oriented beats and put yourself in the eyes and in the body of your characters. Slow down, look around, see what, the, what they see and feel, and specifically look for things that are unexpected about the moment because that's what's really really going to make your content sing and that's what will separate you from AI content. Um, and finally, insight. Expand the conversation. Don't just lean on um, public perception and, and public conversation of the day. Try to be inquisitive. Look around and see where, where public conversation is failing or falling down. Where, where are the opinions that people um, start, where people start repeating themselves and they're not doing original research? That's where you want to be doing original research and then going and inserting that into your work. Um, so those are, uh, those are your human strengths and things that you can do that AIs cannot. Um, and that sort of uh, summarizes um, everything that I've gathered about AI uh, to this point. I will keep 
producing other live streams um, as I learn more about the AIs and as the technology changes. So if you are interested to see the evolution of AI, um, please stay active in our Discord. I will post events. Um, I'll probably post an event uh, at least every other month, but probably once a month um, on writing with AI. I'm also going to be putting out a um, AI art live stream series. Um, addressing a lot of these same questions, but from an art perspective, and that does touch on authors and what authors do. So if you have questions over there, um, feel free to post them in our Art AI Questions channel um, or watch for the Art AI live streams. Um, so thank you so much for your time. If you would like to support the work that we're doing, uh, please go check out my book, Sweeter Than Silence, that is coming out on May 24th. You can pre-order it um, on Backerkit. I will post the link in our um, in our open chat uh, right after this live stream ends. Um, so that that book is about audience desire. Um, it covers marketing through humanization and trying to identify what it is that readers crave, um, and and when they are are looking at what we offer as a creator, um, what is it that we are being weighed against. Um, so I'm, I'm very proud of that book, very excited to release it, and, uh, if you appreciate the insights that you've had here today, um, this book is chock full of them, uh, chock full of more rich original content, and, uh, I, uh, I hope that you'll pick up a copy, so...